I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Sarah Faber uh, from Simon Fraser University, where she's situated at the Institute for Neuroscience and Neurotechnology. And uh, Sarah, <laughs> yes, you can see it in the background there. Sarah completed her PhD at the University of Toronto on the brain dynamics of music listening across the adult lifespan. And her interest in music and healthcare stems from her past work as a music therapist in long-term care and adult mental health. And music's profound and enduring connection throughout the lifespan is what inspires her research work. And uh, Sarah is currently completing a postdoctoral fellowship at Simon Fraser University's Institute for Neuroscience and Neurotechnology. And I'm delighted to uh, say that she's actually co-funded by the Alzheimer's Society of BC and Michael Smith Health, Health Research BC. So welcome, Sarah. And I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. Hey, thank you so much, Heather, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for, for coming to, to spend time with me today. Um, this is a real treat. Um, I'm just absolutely delighted to be here. So I'm going to launch on in today. We're going to be talking about, you know, hopefully not a, uh, not a surprise, we're going to be talking about music today. So uh, mapping the musical brain or what the aging brain can tell us about music and then what music can tell us about the aging brain, uh, an area that is very near and dear uh, to my, certainly my interests um, and hopefully some of yours as well. So what we'll be talking about today is a little bit about me, uh, a little bit about how the brain ages, how the brain listens to music, uh, how music and dementia interact and then how we use music in everyday life, um, and then how we can use music kind of, you know, as we as we continue to develop. So who am I and what am I doing here? Um, fair question. Um, I'm a neuroscientist working at Simon Fraser University under the lab of Dr. Randy McIntosh, who is another neuroscientist. We came to Simon Fraser University from the University of Toronto, where I completed my PhD. Um, but I'm originally from Halifax, Nova Scotia, so the exact other side of the country. I, most of my family and all of my in-laws are out there. Um, I have a sister that lives in Halifax, a sister that lives in Sweden, and it is very entertaining to us that my sister in Sweden is closer to my family in Halifax than I am out here on the West Coast. So I'll be headed back there in a couple weeks' time to, to do the whole holiday thing with the family, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, prior to my science life, as Heather said, I was a music therapist. Um, and prior to that, I was and still am a musician. So I was always very interested in music and how, you know, we connected with music. That's me over here playing with my old orchestra or doing a, a concert in, in Halifax on a night very similar to the weather we're having here. A lot of fog, a lot of rain. Um, although I am quite delighted that most where I am in Port Moody, the rain at least falls up and down in Halifax, it kind of rains sideways most of the time. And that's, I don't recommend it. Umbrellas out in the East Coast are purely decorative, but uh, you know, it's a great place. I highly recommend going. <laughs> so from music to music therapy, when I was working as a music therapist, I mainly worked in adult mental health, long-term care, and in forensic mental health. So most of my clients were individuals uh, living in long-term care facilities that had severe dementia. So we're talking individuals that um, did not speak anymore and who did not participate in a lot of recreation activities. Most of them are language-based and with language deterioration, we found that, that there was like it was it was difficult for these individuals to, to participate in recreation and to have social uh, interaction with their peers. So they were usually referred to music therapy. And then we would, you know, listen to music, we would play music together. And I was absolutely blown away by how much they still connected with music and they still used music in really exciting ways, which you know, gave me a lot of questions, far more questions than answers. Uh, and that's what brought me to, to being uh, in, in science. Just always a good time. So that's a little bit about me. I have been in BC for two years now. Quite like it. Your mountains are gorgeous. Your people are friendly. It's, it's lovely. So let's dive right in and think about what music is for. We spend a lot of time thinking about this scientifically because as far as we know, every culture on earth has music, every human culture. And trying to figure out why we have developed this behavior is, is interesting scientifically. So there's a couple of theories. 
one of them we're getting right in with the spicy stuff, a uh, sexual selection. So this theory is that we developed music kind of like birds and animals kind of have these songs and these dances that they use to attract a mate. Um, perhaps music is is part of part of human culture because it helps us, you know, seem attractive to other people and it helps us judge the attractiveness of other people. Um, another one is uh, for work purposes. So this is a Ukrainian dance troupe and they are exhibiting a, a working song. So did we develop music because it helps us, you know, connect with people um, when we have a common goal? If you think about it, if you've ever rowed a boat, we have songs for rowing the boat and that gives us a tempo and a rhythm that we can all align to together. Um, another one, do we use music uh, to connect with a higher power? Um, if you think about religious ceremonies, music is usually a big part of that. So do we use music to talk to God, for example? Um, there's a beautiful uh, mask dance being displayed here from Coast Salish peoples. And then do we use music to kind of connect with our community when we may be separated from it? Canada is a very multicultural place. So we contain within the country of Canada many different musical traditions and so do we use that as kind of a way of keeping our traditions alive for us so there is no one answer to this question of what is music for the answer is probably yes all of the above um so maybe just kind of think about what you think music is for and what you use it for um one of the great philosophers and theorists in music science propose this concept called floating intentionality. So we've developed music and language both side by side, but language helps when we need to be very precise. And in some cases, music helps when we need to be a little bit less precise. If you can think about something like a diplomatic, um, a, a, a diplomatic consultation or, or a diplomatic procedure, the words that the words that you're using have a big, very important effect. And if you and the other person don't necessarily speak the same language, suddenly the the angst has gone way up. The ability to uh, the ability to make yourself understood is now much more difficult than if you're sitting around and playing music. So his theory with floating intentionality is that way, 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 way back before modern humans emerged, we might have developed this behavior when we needed to communicate with people between communities where we weren't necessarily all communicating in the same way. And our ability to perceive music starts when we're very, very, very young. If you have children or if you've spent any time around babies, um, they respond very well to music. Colleagues of mine in Finland, where I did my master's degree, um, were studying error detection in newborn babies. So what they did was they had the parents listen to the same song every day during the second and third trimester of pregnancy. And then as soon as the baby was born, um, the hospital would call the research assistants who would be up at whatever hour of the night and playing the same song to the baby while they collected brain data using an electrode placed on the baby's forehead. There is a, a, an electrical signature that you can use to pick up error detections in tiny babies. Um, and sure enough, they were playing the music. And then when they put errors into the music, there was a, a, a little response indicating that perhaps the baby was detecting that error. Um, and just another piece of fun facts, uh, the oldest instruments that were ever discovered were um, bird and mammoth bone flutes that were discovered in a cave in Germany, um, dated to probably 43,000 years ago, uh, which is pretty, which is pretty amazing. And then they were singing and drumming, you know, many, many, many tens of thousands of years before then. So point I'm trying to make, what is music for? Music is for many things. It goes a long way back um, and we hang on to it for a very long time. So how does the brain age? So one of the things we think about in development is it's kind of something that we do when we're children and then we grow into adolescence and then we go through puberty and then thank God puberty is over and we're adults kind of end of story. Um, but we never really stop developing. So aging, we can think about, it's often framed as things, you know, negative a little bit. We might be slowing down. Things might seem more challenging. There are, you know, a lot of us wear glasses. I think they're fantastic. Um, hearing issues, that's, you know, fine. But we can think about brain aging as a process of refinement. We get more experienced at being alive. And that means our brains are constantly reorganizing and making themselves a little bit more optimal for the life that we are living. So, 
What that means in the literature, scientific studies have been conducted on making decisions. So older adults are generally better able to make moral decisions. We know what we want when we're older. There's increased satisfaction with those decisions. So a young person might second guess their decision that they've made, like, oh, was that the right decision? Whereas an older adult is like, no, I know exactly what I wanted to do. I did that. I am satisfied with my choice. And then um, the last thing here is a positivity effect. So um, there's studies looking at emotional stimuli. So these could be things like videos, scenarios, pieces of music. And generally, older adults will find that unpleasant stimuli is less unpleasant than younger adults. Um, and the theory behind that is that with experience comes perspective. So if we can all just imagine, you know, if you've spent, again, if you've spent time with teenagers or if you yourself remember your adolescence, um, everything that happened seemed like, ah, this is the worst thing that has ever happened. This is the best thing that has ever happened. And that could have been entirely accurate. But again, with age comes perspective. And so there's generally a wider spread of good versus bad experiences. We know what the limits of those experiences are. And so life overall seems to skew a little bit more positively with older age. So if you think about the brain as a library, um, we're constantly adding books, newspapers, paintings, periodicals, all that good stuff. Um, and a bigger library takes more time to navigate, but the chances of finding the answer that you're looking for also, uh, also increases. So I like to kind of frame how the brain ages, again, as a process of refinement. Um, so again, we're developing, we're getting better, stronger all the time. And again, you know, I, we, we can't say what the working conditions of the librarian is like. If you're constantly putting more books into this library, they're probably worked off their feet. But certainly a, a really good uh, a really good thing to think about, you know, all these books crashing around up there. So how does the brain listen to music? This is work from colleagues of mine again in Finland. And I'm going to play it. And what you're going to be looking at is all of the brain activity in response to this piece of tango music by Astor Piazzolla. So the first thing that I'll draw your attention to is over on the side of the brain here. So this is the back of the brain with the cerebellum and the brain stem here. On the sides of the brain, this is where the temporal lobes are located. And the temporal lobes are the regions that get the input from the ears. So for the longest time, there was kind of theories that the brain was a collection of different pieces and each one of those pieces had a job and that piece of the brain would respond when you were either doing that job or receiving that input but over the years understanding of the brain has expanded to say look actually most of the brain is active most of the time it's it's not kind of one of those uh 10 of the brain type things that seems to enter public consciousness every so often so Lots of regions are active. There's no one music center in the brain. The ears and the region behind them are definitely have an important role to play, but that's not all of what's happening here. Ah, I see a question here. Where is that library? So, so much apologies. The library in the last slide was at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. Um, so I'm going to play this little video again and just watch the side pieces of the brain here to see what the ears are doing, but then also see how the activity is going throughout the entire piece. So here are our auditory cortex where the input from the ears is coming. Lots of stuff is happening in there, and uh, and that's you know, a what we like to see, and b what makes it such a such a, a complicated thing to try to research. <laughs> so, how do we hear? If we're going to talk about music, we do need to talk about hearing. So, 
sound hits the ear and every sound hits the ear. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a musical signal, if it's a voice, if it's like a loud bang, um, an alarm clock, all sound is displacement of air. That air enters the ear and gets converted into electricity where it is sent to the brain. And then the brain, the signal propagates through the brain and from that sound, you get additional information such as, oh, is that a person's voice? Do I know that person? Oh, what's their name? And then all of the other information that is coming with that person's, like with, with that speech signal. So you're listening to me talk right now. You might be able to tell that I am a woman. I am speaking to you. I come from the East Coast. If you have a good ear for accents, I might have a little bit of a little bit of a stuffy nose just because of this weather. Um but then there's also what I'm saying. And so your brain is putting all of these pieces together and turning the noise that I am producing into language and into something that you can understand and maybe even something that sparks a uh, familiarity or a memory for you. And that's, you know, from sound to the ears, to electricity, to the brain, and then to beyond to our, to our uh, human experience, how we experience sounds is, is quite a thing. So I'm going to play a little video to show us all how the ears work. And it's, it's a few minutes, so I might pause it uh, frequently, but I think this is the best illustration of how sound is converted into the ear. And it uses music, which I love. The sense of hearing is accomplished by a process known as auditory transduction. The ear converts sound waves in the air into electrical impulses, which can be interpreted by the brain. As sound enters the ear, it passes through the external auditory canal, where it meets the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane then vibrates in response to the sound. Sounds of a lower pitch, or frequency, produce a slower rate of vibration. And sounds of lower volume, or amplitude, produce a less dramatic vibration. Higher frequency sounds produce faster vibrations. The tympanic membrane is cone-shaped and articulates with a chain of three bones called the auditory ossicles. They consist of the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The movements of the tympanic membrane vibrate the ossicles, passing on the information of frequency and amplitude. The three bones pivot together on an axis shown here in red. The pivotal axis is due to a series of ligaments which hold the bones in place within the middle ear cavity. The anterior malleal ligament and the posterior incutal ligament are of particular importance for the pivotal axis. Two structures which normally obscure this view of the middle ear have been removed. They are the chordae tympani nerve and the tendon of the tensor tympani muscle. Through the ossicles, the vibrations of the tympanic membrane are transferred to the footplate of the stapes. The stapes moves with a piston-like action, which sends vibrations into a structure called the bony labyrinth. The labyrinth is filled with a fluid called paralymph. If it were a completely closed and inflexible system, the movement of the stapes would be unable to displace the paralymph, and therefore unable to send vibrations into the bony structure. Due to the flexibility of a membrane called the round window, the stapes movement can displace the paralymph, allowing vibrations to enter the labyrinth.
The corridor leading to the round window is found within the spiral portion of the bony labyrinth, known as the cochlea. Vibrations produced by the stapes are drawn into the spiral system and return to meet the round window. The portion of the spiral passage in which vibrations ascend to the apex of the cochlea is called the scala vestibuli. The descending portion of the passage is called the scala tympani. A third structure, called the cochlear duct, is situated between the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani. The cochlear duct is filled with a fluid called endolymph, and when viewed in cross-section, the membranes separating the two fluid-filled systems are visible. They are Reissner's membrane and the basilar membrane. The membranes are flexible and move in response to the vibrations traveling up the scale of vestibuli. The movements of the membranes then send vibrations back down to the scale of tympani. A specialized structure called the organ of corti is situated on the basilar membrane. As the basilar membrane vibrates, the organ of corti is stimulated, which sends nerve impulses to the brain via the cochlear nerve. The actual nerve impulses are generated by specialized cells within the organ of corti called hair cells. The hair cells are closely covered by a structure called the tectorial membrane. As the basilar membrane vibrates, the tiny clusters of hairs are bent against the tectorial membrane, triggering the hair cells to fire. The entire basilar membrane does not vibrate simultaneously. Instead, specific areas along the basilar membrane move variably in response to different frequencies of sound. Lower frequencies vibrate the basilar membrane closer to the apex of the cochlea whereas higher frequencies produce vibrations closer to the base. This arrangement is known as tonotopic organization. Together, this sequence of events is responsible for our acoustic perception of the world around us. So I'll pause that there. I just think it's a really great illustration of something that we do all the time, we hear, um, and then how just really wonderfully complex the system is um, that allows us so to do. It just, every time I watch this video, I'm always just like, oh, I'll just, I'll see if there's like a, a two minute segment that I can show in a talk. And then I wound up just showing the entire thing every time because it's just wonderfully interesting. So a tiny yet intensely sophisticated system. So that's hearing, but now let's get back to music. So earlier when I said that there is really no one music center in the brain, uh, this is kind of what I'm talking about. So these are all of the known regions that have been identified as important to the study of music through scientific study. So what we do um, in a music listening study is generally play music to people when they're listening or play music to people while we're also collecting brain data. So this can be done in one of many ways. Um, my work uses a combination of electroencephalography. So this is a little machine that you pop on someone's head. It's a little cap. And then uh, electrodes are fitted onto that cap and they collect electrical impulses coming from your brain. So it's kind of like a, a microphone. If you can think about it as a very powerful microphone that's picking up the electricity um, and then amplifying it into a computer. And then we can turn that electrical data into numbers that we can then do a lot of uh, fun math and statistics on. Um, the other machine, which some of you may be familiar with is an MRI or a um, magnetic resonance imaging, which is a far more complicated beast. It's a big metal tube and it takes pictures of magnetic fields uh, driven by the blood flow around your brain. Um, so this one, you end up usually going to a hospital facility, you can't have any metal on you or in you, and then you're placed into the machine and uh, it's quite loud, which means that we have to fit people with special headphones that have no met metallic components whatsoever and play the music in the scanner. And then we look at what the brain is doing uh, lined up with what is happening in the music. So 
Um, the brain is constantly picking up information. Again, like with speaking, being able to identify the person's voice, whether you know them, and then how that voice is built up into words and sentences and concepts, and then maybe memories and understanding. We have the same relationship with a musical signal. So music has very tiny elements in it as well, kind of like a, the, the quality of someone's voice. If I'm playing a flute, you'll know that a flute is different than a drum, perhaps. Um, but then music is built up like language into these larger units of meaning. So we can think about something like a melody, whether you can tap your toe along to the beat. Um, and that piece of music right, might remind you of something, uh, something important to you. It's like, oh, this is the music that was playing when I was you know, this is my wedding song. This is a song that my my parents used to sing to me when I was younger, um, for example, or it's maybe it's a song that you really dislike. Oh, I hate that song. I was, you know, we're quite good at uh, at what we do and do not like in music. And music is very good at, at making us make those decisions. So that's a bit of an example of how the brain listens to music. And so all of these different regions have a role to play in this very complex up and down understanding of how music works. So to give you a bit of an example on um, on some of these units of musical meaning, and we've kind of covered that, you know, my voice is going to be different than a snap, which I think Zoom is very good at editing out. Um, so a slightly larger unit of information is a phrasing and melody. So if I were to say twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you thermos that's not the right ending for that. Um, and we know that. So even though if we don't consider ourselves musicians or if we have no musical training, you know generally what is supposed to come next. So if we try it again, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you... How many of you sang R at the end? <laughs> It's always strange. You kind of got to leave it hanging there a little bit, but we're quite good at making predictions. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you, Celia. <laughs> we're very good at, at hearing and learning very quickly. Even if you're not familiar with the song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, you can make a prediction of what is going to come next. Um, and we do that without being taught. So we are exposed to music in a lot of different ways from a very, very early age. And we are constantly taking this information in and using it to be able to make predictions and to gather information and be able to apply that information to, to new music that we find in the future, which makes it really music a very useful tool when we're studying the brain, but it also does make it quite complicated um, because with all of this complexity, then um, how can we ever hope to group people together and, and to learn things? So. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my specific research now. So I work in a brain lab and I am really interested in how music changes throughout the adult lifespan with the onset of dementia. So like I said, my music therapy work, I mainly worked in long-term care with people with severe Alzheimer's disease. And uh, a lot of my clients, again, had stopped speaking, but they were still able to sing. And so I had a lot of family members kind of coming up to me being like, I haven't, I haven't been able to speak to, to my loved one in quite a, quite a little while. Why are they singing? And I was like, I, I honestly don't know. I would love to be able to, to give you an answer, but I, but I can't. Um, and it wasn't just that they were able to sing, you know, people were dancing, people were coming up with novel music. I could give somebody an instrument and play, just improvise something and they would improvise back. And in that way we would have a musical conversation. And I was really fascinated at what in the brain was driving that effect. Um, because at that point, when someone is nonverbal, you can't ask them about it. You know, people are very good at talking about music at what they like. People are especially good at telling you what they don't like in music. Um, but if somebody has a speech impediment or if somebody does not have the use of language anymore, that becomes very difficult. And so I think, you know, one of my pet concerns, and we can talk about this a little bit later, is how science needs to really catch up and develop um, ways in which to communicate and to understand individuals that no longer have the use of language. Um, because if we think about a scientific study, generally you answer a lot of questions, uh, questionnaires, there's assessments, and a lot of these assessments, as you will know if you've ever visited a doctor, are based on language. You know, tell me 
what's happening tell me your problem how does this feel etc so in this work we had younger and older adults listening to music and we had them listen to music in an MRI scanner. So we were taking pictures of their brains during music listening. And the music was one of two types. It was music that the person brought into the lab that was very familiar, that they it was their favorite music, or it was music that the researchers had selected that the person wasn't super familiar with um, and that maybe they liked, maybe they didn't. And we had, again, younger adults that were mainly undergraduate students at the university where this data was collected. And then the older adults were anyone who was between 57, I think, and 92 years of age. That was the spread that we had. Um, and one of the things that we found was that younger adults had a very noticeable pattern that the older adults didn't. So these are brains here. We have uh, this little clock here of four different brains. These are networks of regions. So these are pieces of the brain that work together during a particular behavior, in this case, music listening. So all of these networks are activated and the brain is navigating between these networks during music listening. And so with younger adults, we found that they were spending a lot of time down here in the bottom network. Um, it has areas related to auditory processing and reward. So we kind of felt that based on previous work, this was indicating that the people were experiencing, again, pleasurable experiences to music. If you think about listening to your favorite song, you know, some people get chills. Um, some people might become very emotional. It just, music makes us feel good, which is another, another reason why we might have developed it in the first place. Um, but younger adults were only getting into this feel-good music network with the music that they really, really liked. If they didn't know the piece of music and didn't like it as much, they were going over here where we have some of the same regions, the auditory cortex on both sides of the brain is involved. So they are still listening to the music. They're not just, you know, switch their ears off and they're a hundred miles away. But if they liked the music, they were down here in the reward network. If they didn't like the music, they were up here in just the regular listening network. But for older adults, they did not have this distinction. Older adults were spending the vast majority of their time down here in the music reward network, indicating that even if they didn't know the piece of music, and even if maybe it wasn't their cup of tea, it still made them feel good, um, which I think is is really wonderful. So the the gentle conclusion that we would make from this maybe is that perhaps as we age, we become less snobbish about the type of music that we listen to. <laughs> Um, so this was, this was a great finding and I was very excited about it. Um, but then the older adults stayed enrolled in a study. So they came in, they did the brain scans, they did the music listening, and then they completed an eight week long music therapy intervention. So these were cognitively healthy, older adults. They didn't have, um, any uh, vascular problems. There was no history of stroke. Uh, they did not have um, any mental health concerns. So no diagnosis or no suspected diagnosis of depression, schizophrenia, pretty healthy older adults. Um, they spent one hour each day listening to music that they liked. And this music was assembled into a playlist that they could just queue up kind of like a compilation album. Um, they had to listen for an hour every day and then they wrote down, you know, thoughts, feelings, impressions, any memories that they had. And then once a week, they would have a session with a music therapist where they would talk about the imagery that they had, or they would talk about um, the thoughts and observations, any memories, all of that good stuff with the music therapist. They would update the playlist if they needed to, but that was, that was pretty much it. And then the music therapist, um, would kind of, you know, provide leading questions. They would explore the different themes that the participants had um, had come up with during the music listening. And at the end of eight weeks of music listening, they did the same protocol. So they came back to the lab. We recorded their brain activity, listening to the exact same pieces of music. And we found that this reward network was even more active after intervention. So compared to younger adults, 
older adults were already spending much more time in this music reward network. But after me, after the music therapy intervention, where they listened to music that they liked for an hour a day, every single day, it didn't matter what kind of music the scientists played to them. They were still activating this music, this auditory reward network. It still made them feel good, um, which was very exciting for me. Um, and what this shows is that maybe something as simple and as enjoyable as music listening can affect the way our brain uh, is organized and could have a little baby effect in how our brain continues to develop with age and neurodegeneration. So um, comparing side by side here, this is the younger adult pattern. So the orange arrows are when people are listening to music they like, the blue arrows are when people are listening to music they don't like. Whereas for older adults, um, the dashed arrows are after the music therapy intervention and the solid arrows are before the music therapy intervention. So for younger adults, liking and familiarity are correlated with reward network activity. In older adults, all music is correlated with reward activity, especially after music listening intervention. So what I like to talk about with this slide, we're kind of comparing apples and oranges here because the brain, again, does change. There are going to be differences in brain activity between younger and older adults, regardless of diagnostic category or any clinical concerns, but it is worth looking at. And when we talk about aging and how we can you know, train our brains to age in a more healthy pattern, we're not going to make it identical to how our brains were as younger adults. We're going to develop something new. And I think that that's really exciting. So how does music work in dementia? Um, we are missing a lot of information on the brain side of things. This is brand new areas for research, and I'm really excited to be part of the team that's working on this. So behaviorally, we know from clinical reports, and I know from my own clinical work as a music therapist, that with dementia, music listening does not look much different. You are still able to get enjoyment out of the music that you've always enjoyed. The music that you didn't enjoy might still be really unpleasant, um, but the behavior does not look a lot different. You can sit there, you can tap your foot, you can sing, you can hum, even if you can't sing. And I have some people in my family that fit this category. You can still sing. It might not be enjoyable for the people around you, but you absolutely can. Um, so behaviorally, we know that there's not much difference between an individual with dementia and an individual without dementia. And that is wonderful. The brain, on the other hand, we do not know, but we're working on it. Stay tuned. So I talked a lot about music therapy, but a little bit about what music therapy does is it uses music um, instead of, you know, talking, for example, uh, to achieve therapeutic goals. So some of the usual music therapeutic goals that I would work for was improving people's quality of life. That is a huge one for us. Uh, we want to promote social interaction. We're finding out more and more as research continues to develop that maintaining social interaction um, really, really helps us age well and uh, and help us recover from you know illnesses, from injuries, and especially at the end of, of a lockdown, which I am sure that you're all very happy that we, we're hopefully coming to the end of this and we won't have to do any of the isolation for too much longer. Um, I think it, it really solidified for a lot of people that social interaction, even if even if it's just as as simple as you know talking to people out at the shops is quite important. Um, music can spark reminiscence. You know, you can hear a song, and again, it could be stimulating a memory that is quite pleasant. It can also be stimulating a memory that is quite unpleasant. There are songs that I cannot listen to without bursting into tears because they remind me of uh, my grandmother, who I grew up with very closely. Uh, she's no longer around, but she was a huge Rita McNeil fan. So now that we're headed into Christmas, um, my sisters and I, we 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 strategically deploy the Rita McNeil if there's ever a time when you just need a good cry. <laughs> Um, music can facilitate communication. Um, again, if language is a bit stressful or if someone is struggling a little bit with word finding, usually singing is a lot easier and a lot less um, fraught than singing together. It can be used for emotional regulation. If you think about when you're in a really crap mood, um, hearing a piece of music that you like can kind of lift you out of it. Um, Similarly, if you know you you struggle working out or you struggle getting moving, maybe putting on a, a piece of music that can put some pep in your step, that is a really good way of, of, a, of doing emotional regulation and motivation. So I use music to motivate myself a lot. Um, 
you know, if I have to do a particularly unpleasant task, you know, I might put on some music to really psych myself up. All of these things that uh, that we use music for, but that is then formalized under music therapy. These are some of the examples of the things that people will do. So if you're interested in maybe like, ah, like I've, I, I really like music or my loved one really likes music and I'm struggling to connect with them. Here are a couple of, you know, little, little top tips on how we can use music in everyday life just to make things a little bit more pleasant. Um, you can listen to music together with people. That's also, you know, we used to do that a lot. I think when I was a teenager, before I was allowed to drive or go out and, and see boys, um, for example, I'd usually just wind up sitting around my friend's place and we would listen to uh, tapes and records. Um, the record was still kind of when I was growing up, uh, the, the big cool thing that everyone's parents had. So you would go to the parents' place and see who had the best record collection. So listening to music together and then uh, and then just storytelling or reminiscing, it's like, ah, it doesn't necessarily have to be a question and answer. Do you remember where we were when we listened to this piece of music? That might be a very intense question to ask somebody, especially if they're having a hard time uh, word finding. But it's like, oh, I remember where we were when we first heard that piece of music. You looked, you looked wonderful. You were the, you know, the handsomest thing going kind of thing. And just storytelling through music is, is just one of my favorite things. Um, my husband and I met at a, uh, at a, an orchestra, a young people's orchestra. And so we, we do a lot of this reminiscing with music together. Um, dance is an excellent way of getting, promoting social bonding and getting people together, you know, even like little chair dances. I remember my grandmother, she was, she would do a lot of great arm choreography. So to this day, I have two dance moves and this is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really nice to again kind of be a little bit uh, be a little bit silly and you can align yourself with somebody and then that the body responds to that really well the two of you are doing the same thing on the same um the same plane and that is that is social bonding and social interaction um in Vancouver we do have uh choirs that are specifically targeted if you have a loved one with Alzheimer's disease or dementia um or if you are interested, if you yourself have Alzheimer's disease or dementia and are interested in um, getting out there and doing musical activity with other people that will be you know, very understanding and, and really, really, really open to modifications on a typical choir for this population, there are some fantastic dementia choirs in Vancouver and I'll have a, a web link to one of them at the end of the talk. And again, using music to motivate or to cue, like if we have a really hard time getting up, you know, put that radio on or put the playlist on, get some music, get some gumption and get up and go. And I would say that these are all things that I do. I don't, I don't sing in a choir, but I do play in a band. Um, and I absolutely, you know, even if I really don't want to go by the time we're, we're usually five or 10 minutes into it, I'm like, oh, I'm actually really happy I'm here. So I, I trick myself into doing a lot of things with music. It is a very, very compelling carrot um, rather than a stick. Although if, you know, you can motivate yourself to do things with music that you don't like, and then you can have a carrot and a stick at the same time, which is, you know, just, just wonderful. But why would you do that to yourself? So to kind of wrap up, these are the questions that I asked at the beginning of the talk. What can the aging brain tell us about music? Well, it can tell us that music is important and it stays important to us as we continue to age. So music can spark reminiscence. It can provide a vehicle for social interaction. It can help us get together and connect with people, even if we don't speak the same language and even if we don't share the same history. Um, if you think about going to a dance or singing together with people or even just being in a concert hall audience, it's all shared experience and music can really bring people together across different divides and promote social bonding. That's a really huge piece of what music can do. But on the flip side, what can music tell us about the aging brain? So we know that networks are still developing as we age and that there are different network patterns and music listening between healthy younger adults and healthy older adults. So there's perfectly normal age related changes that happen as we age and our brain continues to develop. Um, we've learned that network activity can change with music listening, which is very exciting. And it might be able to teach us about how the brain develops with dementia. So please do stay tuned uh, because this is work that is that is just starting up and I'm very excited to get to work on it all. So the thing that I always come back to is that music moves us. And what I am hoping to find in my research is a brain, like an understanding of how these experiences and 
how we connect with this with this thing, this music that we all understand and that we all connect with, you know, every day, whether we're doing it by ourselves or with loved ones. Or, you know, even just incidentally, you're getting off the bus and there's a, a, a shop blaring Christmas music. We all understand what music is. Um, and for most of us, it does move us in quite a special way. So I'm really, really looking forward to seeing what the brain can tell us about that. So future resources for those of you that are interested. Um, Voices in Motion Vancouver is a choir that is specifically um, for individuals with dementia and their loved ones. Uh, they do rehearsals, they put on performances, and it is a really fantastic initiative. So if you're interested in that, do look up Voices in Motion. Um, if you're interested in participating in any of the research that we've got going on up here at Simon Fraser, you're more than welcome to email us. Um, INN for the Institute for Neuroscience and Neurotechnology at SFU. We'll be getting some projects started in the new year. And uh, if you want to hear more about those, you're more than welcome to get in touch. We would love to hear from you. And then finally, if you're a, if you're a bookish type person, and I think that anyone that shows up to a, an afternoon webinar on this on the neuroscience of music, you, we've probably got a couple of readers in the crowd. Uh, there's a couple of really lovely books that I will recommend to you. One of them, uh, brand new by Canadian scientist Adriana Barton, Wired for Music or a science journalist, and Musicophilia by Oliver Sacks. These are two wonderful books um, that also exist in Book on Tape. So if you're a Book on Tape fan, um, definitely do check them out. And these are my contact details. The only thing left for me to do is thank you to the Alzheimer Society of BC and Michael Smith Health Research BC for their support of my research and extra special thanks to Heather and Ashton and Ava for the, and, the, and their team um, for putting on this webinar series and for inviting me. And of course, a big, big, big extra special thanks uh, to you in the audience for coming. Please do email me if you have any questions about music in the brain, or if you just want to chat about anything that I talked to today, I'm more than happy to, to take any inquiries. Um, so thank you again so much. And please just give me your questions. I would love to answer them. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was just a fantastic uh, presentation. And there's a, there's a, a couple of questions uh, that have popped up and then we'll give oh, folks a chance to, to ask some more uh, as, as well. So I think mm -hmm. um, one of the, one of the questions earlier on was around sort of hearing loss and how that might change um, brain patterns. And then that kind of prompted another question as well about, you know, folks who have hearing loss and have dementia and, you know, how might they still kind of access music? So I guess those are two sort of separate questions. Oh, absolutely. And those are fantastic questions and, and ones that we spend a really long time thinking about. So with hearing loss, um, of course, if the information that is getting into the brain is like, again, coming from the ears and those electrical impulses and just like that really cool video, um, you're sometimes people kind of describe it as only getting part of the information. And this is hugely problematic with language because, you know, even a word or a half of a word can change the meaning of a sentence. Um, but with music, we think about the units of meaning being a little bit longer and we're usually able to guess with music. It's, it's a little bit less high stakes. So even with, you know, moderate hearing loss, people generally report still enjoying music because they don't have to understand every single word or every single note. They can get enough of the overall picture to still have that pleasurable experience. Um, now with, you know, hearing aids, that makes things really, you know, you, you can still get the same fidelity. Um, I remember my great aunt, she wore hearing aids uh, pretty much her entire adult life. And so she would love going to the orchestra because there was no microphones, no amplification, but she had a really hard time. Um, we used to try to take her to rock shows and she, she didn't really enjoy that because she found the amplified sound um, was really difficult on the hearing aids. They didn't know what to do about that. Um, but it is a, a big question. And again, I think one that we probably need better tools to investigate is especially if someone develops hearing loss and dementia around the same time. And then these really kind of like language-based assessments where it's like, okay, can you hear this? Yes, no, you know, which is better? I just recently went to the optometrist, you know, which is better, A or B? Can you read the tiny little impossible letters? That would be very, very, very difficult um, if I was starting to struggle again with my word finding or if my language was, was not up to snuff. Okay. Uh, great, thanks. And uh, another question sort of slightly related is, is mm -hmm. the volume of the music 
perceived differently in dementia, aside from the hearing loss factor, i.e. Yeah. is louder music more distressing or not? Yeah, and that is a fascinating question. So for some people um, with dementia, noises can become a little bit more distressing. Um, loud noises in particular can cause more of a startle response. Um, so for some people, I would say that yes, the volume is probably perceived or the, the whole stimulus is perceived as generally a little bit more alarming. Um, and one of the interesting ways that you can test that is by playing music to people that they're very familiar with. And then usually that startling response will go way down. And it's just like, oh, I remember this. You know, even if the verbalization of I remember this is not there, you can see people kind of relax into it and they might be, you know, nodding or snapping or toe tapping. Um, I remember working with a with a lady one time. She was absolutely fantastic. She um, had developmental disability as well as dementia. So when she was younger, she spoke with quite an intense speech impediment, and then she had stopped speaking um, kind of midway through through the progression of, of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but I was playing a song and she just, you know, was kind of relaxed, seemed like she was going to, you know, go and maybe have a little nap. And then all of a sudden she started singing, <laughs> singing the words with no stutter, no speech impediment whatsoever. And you're like, oh, that's, that's really interesting. There's something going on here. Um, but we usually try to remain very aware of this, this volume issue. So it's just getting to know the people that we're working with. So I remember working with a few people, um, veterans, especially that were dealing with PTSD as well as dementia, um, that may have been having flashbacks, um, you know, to being in, in wartime scenarios, again, especially if medical equipment is constantly beeping and going off and they're hearing the loud noises of the, um, the medication or even the food carts, you know, even the cart that was filled with, you know, a trolley of tea and sweets, which is, you know, objectively a pretty great thing. That sound is going to cue up a, a pretty unpleasant memory. So being aware of who is more and more likely uh, to have this response and then kind of getting in front of that and saying, okay, we're going to play some music. We're going to start quiet and then we're going to ramp it up and then see, you know, how this person is going to respond. But yeah, that's a really fantastic question. And I guess that kind of leads into uh, another question around, you know, how might caregivers who are supporting someone living at home uh, and who's living with dementia, you know, how might music, how might they use music in that that context? You talked uh, a little bit about kind of listening to music and and uh, musical outings, those sorts of things. Do you have any other mm -hmm. sort of thoughts around that? My big one is always um, just kind of closeness and emotional, like the 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 maintenance of emotional bonds through shared music experiences, um, because like obviously our re relationships are going to be changing and relationships do change over the course of of regular you know, regular old development. Like I don't, uh, I, my husband and I are not the same people that we were to each other now when we were in our twenties, thank God, <laughs> you know, things are constantly changing, but, um, I find that the ability to, to kind of be close to each other with something like music listening, you know, putting on an album that you like, or even discovering something new that maybe you like, or don't like, and then just, just sitting there and letting it wash over you and then not having to necessarily, not having to produce anything out of it, but just the the knowledge that you're there sharing in that experience. I usually find that is really lovely. Um, and then kind of on the flip side, an intensely practical suggestion is if you, again, the, the motivation piece is really huge. If you find um, it's really difficult to transition somebody, like leaving the house, by, especially as we're heading into winter, that is a really long drawn out procedure. You know, you have to put on all your base layers and then your warm socks and then your boots and then your jacket. And it's like, oh God, I've got to take the boots off because I forgot my keys all the way across the house, you know? So really using music to kind of keep the energy up and keep the momentum and give like, giving loved ones something to focus on that is enjoyable, even when the environment might be changing, that that usually helps quite a bit as well. Okay, great. I, yeah, I love, love that suggestion. Yeah. And uh, uh, got another question coming in here. It says, uh, my mom lives in a dementia cottage of 10 people mm -hmm. and responds really well to classical and old jazz but the mm -hmm. staff's musical preferences differ a little bit uh, and lean towards uh, modern pop music, which Aww. of course mom hates and, and really then avoids being in that space in the cottage. And uh, how might you put this tactfully to staff? So wearing oh, your music yes. therapist hat here. Yeah, exactly. Well, first of all, I'm on your mom's side here. That's, <laughs> that's 
Oh no. Um, what I would probably do is just like, Hey, I've noticed that that mom isn't kind of like coming out and, and being in the, being in the shared space anymore. Would you mind if I put on one of her CDs to see if I could get her out here a little bit more? Um, and then seeing, seeing what the response is in that. And just like, Oh, wow. Look, isn't she so happy? What do you think? You know? make it seem like it's their idea is always my suggestion <laughs> but um one of the things that I would I would really stress is that your mom loves music loves a particular type of music and can we maybe try this as a as a team uh mm -hmm. together that would be my suggestion but that sounds like that sounds like a fantastic uh place in Gibson's like what a gorgeous spot oh and Lise has also uh shared some some book recommendations up here uh, this is your brain on music and the world in six songs, both of them by Dan Levitin. I'll just pop them back into the chat because uh, those those are are really good books as well. And Sarah, I know you mentioned a little bit about the the super cool work that you're doing up at the lab. Mm -hmm. You and your colleagues are doing, and I'm wondering, just to, you know, in a nutshell, uh, if you can tell us a little bit about. Um, the research that you're you're focused on at the moment and I guess related to that is are you recruiting participants at all for your study uh, yes, or will you be at, uh, well we definitely will be um, probably in the new year we're, we're working through uh, some study design right now we're really hoping to to speak to some folks from the the BC Alzheimer's Society to make sure that we're working on projects and answering questions that are important to this population specifically. Because, um, you know, you never want as a scientist to kind of parachute in somewhere. It's like, ah, I've got a fantastic idea. We're all going to research this and then goodbye forever. You know, you want it to be a team. Uh, teamwork Teamwork makes the dream work, right? So what we are going to be doing is exploring more about how the brain, again, brain development changing with age. We're going to be doing some music listening with healthy older adults, healthy adults with um, mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. And just very, very simple, like come in, do some brain scans, listen to some music, and then looking at, again, the networks, how the brain is navigating around those networks, whether we can find any differences. And then we are hoping to um, get some partnerships going with some treatment facilities around here and look at if we can do a similar study with individuals with severe dementia who might be living in care to see if we can put some of the scientific understanding underneath music therapy. Um, when I was working as a clinician, we had a lot of these wonderful case reports where we saw people responding wonderfully to music. Uh, but again, science has been very slow to catch up with, with the work that's going on currently. So we don't have the tools to necessarily measure how this behavior is working and how it can be beneficial um, to people living with dementia and their caregivers. So we're really hoping to come in, put some of the science under that, and then maybe go forward to advocate for, for better access to music and music-based therapies for people in care, their caregivers, um, community funding for music-based projects, et cetera. So we will eventually be recruiting. Um, and then if uh, if anyone is interested in kind of learning about that, the inn at sfu.ca uh, email address will be your go-to. And you can also email me at any point to, to just ask questions or see, you know, see what I'm doing. Just keep, keep, make sure I'm, make sure I'm working. <laughs> well, and you know, it's such an exciting project, I think, as someone who uh, comes from a recreation background and long-term care uh, at the start of my career and thinking about how valuable uh, music therapy was. And yet it's always, it's always one of those, it's seen as an extra and it would be really yeah. nice to, to bring that evidence forward. So it was more embedded in, in our care models for sure. So, well, as we kind of just the, the hour ticks over just a little bit after three here, really want to, uh, to thank you again, Sarah, for taking time out of your day to share that knowledge, the music, fascinating to see how music lights up our brain. And I don't know if anyone else had that moment where you're watching brains on the screen, listen to music. And as you're listening to music, recognizing that that's actually happening in your own brain at the same time. Um, but uh, yes, uh, great to have all of you join us today. And just to uh, give you a bit of a heads up that our, our next Research Connects would typically be in February. We kind of had to jiggle the schedule slightly so we could uh, accommodate some other fantastic speakers. So we're hoping that you'll join us in early March. So on Wednesday, March the 6th, and we're looking at a potential topic of participating in clinical trials. And so closer to the time, 
time, we'll post additional details, including a registration link at alzbc.org forward slash webinars. So alzbc.org forward slash webinars. So thank you again uh, to Sarah and to everyone for joining us today and wishing you uh, a warm and cozy rest of the day as we find ourselves in an atmospheric river or the winter woes around the, the province. So, and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Bye-bye now.